Welcome everybody to Pacific Northwest Sculptors March Madness Meeting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're looking for basketball, you're on the wrong channel. Um, so do me a favor, please mute yourself unless you have a question. It'll just make it a lot easier. We're expecting a lot of people on the call tonight. We have a number of guests and I want to make sure that you are all welcome. Uh, some from Northwest or uh, Sculptors Northwest and I believe maybe a couple from uh, Northwest Stone Sculptors Association. So welcome. Our presenter tonight is Scott Price and he will be with you in a few minutes, but we have some business to take care of first and I wanna get that out of the way. Um, April 24th is International Sculptors Day, which we have participated in for a number of years and we are doing it again this year. It is mostly virtual but there is a live element to it. I'm going to let Chayo Wilson explain what's going on and how it works. Uh, you are all welcome to participate virtually, but we will have a live contingent in collaboration with Oregon Society of Artists. Chayo, tell us more. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm trying this again. Last is day we worked at my house and tried to build a sculpture together. And I came up with a plan this year um, and decided to reach outside our membership um, <clears throat> to um, a school here in Portland called Helen's View. And they work with at-risk kids that are pregnant or have been incarcerated. They get them very individualized education um, they even have a daycare for the young people that have children on site. And I'm so excited to be working with Alejandro Ceballos, who's a painter here in town, and he's also the art teacher at this school. And so he and I are going to work with hopefully five students. They start in class, in person next Monday. So we have not really nailed down which kids will want to participate yet. But um, we are going to build a sculpture and, and um, <clears throat> um, Bill Lee has started making the structure that will hold the, the ceramic parts that these kids are gonna sculpt. So it's gonna be um, really interesting to watch them. We'll be over there at, at, on site but I'm gonna have a couple meetings, maybe two or three, where we build the parts. And probably on that day, we will be uh, carving and putting color on them. So we'll actually get to see how it's all gonna look. That's my hope. And mm -hmm. hopefully Alejandro will talk about the art program, mentoring program, which I hope we, we will all get involved in at some point. Um, and possibly Don, the principal, who has really turned this school around and made it really um, successful for the, for the students that have gone through. So I'm looking forward to it. So the theme underlying this event is unrecognized. It was an idea that Andy came up with, inspired by the uh, renegade sculpture of York that was put up in Mount Tabor Park by an unknown artist. And that got his imagination going on how much art is done by people who are unrecognized or how much art is not done by people who are unrecognized. So this is an attempt for us to maybe open things up a little bit. Um, this is the first uh, partnership of this kind with Oregon Society of Artists. They have been um, very anxious to be more engaged with us and have invited us to participate in uh, more of the shows in their gallery and uh, even offer some workshops through their uh, through their facility. Uh, and the fact that we're going to be able to put this piece on display when it's finished in their, their they have a, a small garden near their entry, which is a, a beautiful place to, to highlight and gain more visibility for us. So that's pretty exciting. Um, Andy is not here. He was going to mention, so I will mention for him, we are also, during that three-hour event, which is going to be streaming live, we're going to be doing some interviews with several of our members and other people in the community, trying to stay within the different aspects of the theme of unrecognized. 
But if you're interested in participating in that, let me know. And all of our members are going to be invited to participate in the event virtually, working from home or just watching whichever you choose to do. There's another opportunity that just popped up this morning I'd like to make everyone aware of. A friend of mine in Hood River who runs the um, Art of Community, which is their um, public art, ongoing public art uh, activity. There's a prime location in downtown Hood River to display a sculpture four to five feet tall that will fit on a 30 inch square base. If you're interested, let me know either through chat or email me, um, get in touch and I will connect you with the people out there and good luck on that one. Our website traffic is looking good and it's growing steadily. Only 60%, I mean only about 40% of our members so far have completed a member page. Do it. You know, what's holding you back? I mean, there's, we, have some, we have some great tutorials already prepared. It's, it, you can probably do it in an hour. And it's an opportunity to link back to your site, which is going to bring you traffic that way. Um, it's, I'm, I, I won't walk you through it because we don't have enough time tonight. But if, if you need any help, contact Dave Fry. I'm sure he can point you in the right direction and get you going. Um, one other thing that's been going on, we have had a couple of conversations with the International Sculpture uh, Center back east. They were the folks who hosted the conference here two years ago. And the conversation is how to elevate us from an affiliate to a full partner. And there are numerous additional benefits that come with that. We are in the process of defining what we would want out of a full partnership. We are wide open to suggestions from anybody. Take a look at their site, sculptors.org, and look at all the, all, all the things that they offer. And you know, beyond us being able to become members of their group at a reduced rate, there are opportunities for us to participate on lots of different levels. So I'm open to suggestions. Please take a look and let us know what you think. Uh, did any of the other board members have anything uh, to say before we move on? Andy, we already covered the, uh, the IS day thing and the interviews. And I want to move on to Scott real quickly. Uh, does anybody else have anything we need to discuss before we get on with the presentation? Okay, uh, Scott Price is our guest this evening. Scott, for the past seven years, has been building uh, an art gallery in a forest uh, on Whidbey Island in Coopville. This is about a 40-acre piece of land with multiple paths, each with a different theme. And Scott has been uh, particip participating in our group for at least a year now. He's incredibly energetic and tr incredibly positive. Uh, he's taken on a fairly gargantuan task. It opened a few months ago. He's gonna give us um, a presentation on what it's taken to do this. Now, Scott has a, a background in real estate management consulting, a couple of other things, but um, most appropriately project management, which is, which is what this project has been all about. So I'm going to introduce this to Scott. If you have questions, it's okay to interrupt him during his presentation, but please stay muted uh, other than that. Scott, take it away. Great, thank you, Chaz, and hi, everyone. First, going to uh, kick it off with a short uh, three-minute video. And I thought that that might be a good way to kind of introduce you to the park because we're not physically there. So this way you can kind of get a walk through at least the part of it. So this is about a three minute long video. This was done uh, by Evening Magazine out of Seattle and uh, they came and uh, we were uh, featured on the Evening Magazine show. That's where this is from. We collectively frequently live lives separated from nature, but when we go into nature, it has a calming and peaceful, relaxing experience for, for everyone. And this century-old forest in Coopville is where Scott Price once planned to build a home. When those plans changed, so did his life's purpose. Instead of selling it, I realized that if I did sell it, it would likely get subdivided and cleared for view. So, and I didn't want that to happen. 
coast. It's beautiful. It's native. And now it's a place to wander in wonder. The Price Sculpture Forest, free to visit every day of the year, with a little more than half a mile of trails and art from sculptors across the Northwest and the United States. Some of these sculptures, if they were in a standard white wall halogen lamp on a track light gallery, be fine, but you put them out in this environment and they really take on a life of their own in terms of the way you interact with them. Like the piece that startled me when we rounded a bend. Yeah. You surprised me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's very, that's intentional too. <laughs> Feet and our legs are our foundation connecting to the earth every, every day. And it's become a favorite place to pose on Instagram. Many of the sculptures fit the definition of whimsy, like the T-Rex and Gorilla, sculpted from driftwood and bow. Or the massive playa flowers made in Port Townsend. This actually came from Burning Man. Other pieces really make you think or have backstories with deep meaning. The next door neighbor to the park uh, his wife sadly died from COVID. She loved eagles. David, the husband, wanted to have an eagle sculpture in her memory. So he actually purchased the sculpture and has donated it to the park so that everybody can enjoy it going forward in Pam's memory. One story of many you can access via a guided tour on your phone. Each artist recorded a description of their work. And to tell a story. Which you can watch while standing next to the real thing. Or you can explore in a more meditative way. Because no matter where you look, there is quiet beauty here. And Scott's dream is for as many people to experience it as possible. It would be fun to share instead of fun to just have my own little little beautiful part of the world but just unto myself and that's been true because art is created by both humans and nature all you have to do is look so yeah so that was uh, that was fun uh, and uh, it was uh, it's fun to do and uh, it was uh, uh, kind of nice we've been getting uh, quite a bit of, uh, of of media attention which has has been great i'll talk about that a little bit later all right so uh, that kind of gave you an overview and i'll i'll dive in a little bit more and uh, and it'll give you some opportunity to ask some questions and uh, and any comments you have so what I, what i was going to talk about tonight uh, is a bit of the background and uh, the vision for what we're trying to or what we're accomplishing at the sculpture forest why we're doing it where where it's at some of our guiding principles and then talk about what we've created so far as well as how we're collaborating with sculptors and uh, talk touch a bit on the future in terms of uh, things we have for our roadmap for the for where we're going uh, in the future so to give you an overview of how this came to be i mean how you know how did the sculpture fires come because uh, basically unlike most sculpture parks which are not all, but many of them, you know, have a very large organization behind them and things like that. Essentially, uh, this was created by me uh, with uh, in collaboration with sculptors and volunteers uh, over the over a period of time. And uh, going back 2008, so about 13 years ago, I purchased the site to build my home there. And uh, but then I, in 2012, four years later, I decided to build elsewhere. So uh, I'm still in Coopville uh, on Whidbey Island, which is where this is located in the same town as this, but I, I ended up building somewhere else. Uh, I, I put the property actually up for sale initially, but I really wanted to preserve the habitat and the forest that was there. And it's a, it's a unique piece of property that I'll tell you about in a, in a little bit here. And, uh, and it, it would be hard to replicate. So I really wanted to find a conservation buyer and I couldn't do that. Everybody that I could find really wanted to subdivide it and clear it. And that's not what I wanted. So uh, shortly thereafter, I actually 
happened to visit some sculpture parks that really inspired me. And they were, uh, they were just very positive, impactful experiences that I had. And uh, a number of them up in the north of Seattle area, there's three of them that I still love right now. I've been to certainly others, but uh, I'd say there's three in particular uh, that uh, there were certain elements of them that, that I really thought were, were, just, were just great. And so basically that same year, and I had this property and I said, hey, Scott, why don't you think big? And so I started saving my money and with the idea of opening a public sculpture park and just, <laughs> just said, hey, I really enjoyed visiting those sculpture parks. I'm going to make my own. So, uh, so I, I started that back in 2014. Uh, I put a conservation easement on the property. And if you're not familiar with what those are, what uh, on title, meaning in legal documents with my property, I have voluntarily restricted myself. And if I were to sell the property, I have no intention to do that, but if I were to sell the property, a future owner also is, has to abide by these restrictions. And there basically are only two things you can do with the property now. You can either leave it as a forest or it can be open as a public park or and specifically a public sculpture park. And that's all you can do with it. You can't build houses on it. You cannot subdivide it. You cannot clear it, anything like that. So, and because I really wanted to preserve it. So if for some reason it, it, it moved on to another owner, they would they would still have to follow by the abide by those same rules. Well, Scott, uh, was that readily embraced, or did you have a lot of uphill battle to get that change happen? Did the community embrace it? Uh, in a big way, yeah. Uh, it, it, in terms of uh, embracing it, uh, I actually worked with the Woodby Comano Land Trust, and they specialize in conservation easements. Okay. And everyone, everyone in the neighborhood loves it because they not only do they have this great park that they now can walk through and walk around, but they in the center of the residential neighborhood is this large piece of property that otherwise would have been clear cut and, and subdivided. Uh, so actually, everybody, it, it, it takes a willing owner like me to do it. But mm -hmm. after that, uh, you know, everybody likes it. <laughs> so, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, so it's right, is it right in Coopville then? Uh, it's just to the east and I'll, and I'll actually in a few slides here, I'll show you, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Coopville, but I'll show you where it's located. Yeah. yeah so it's right outside of Coopville. Yeah. Coopville address. Yeah. And uh, so in uh, 2015, I started uh, researching and designing sculpture parks, you know, nothing I had ever done before. And, uh, uh, you know, how to try to figure out how to do this and uh, read books, talked to people who had, ran sculpture parks, the whole deal. Uh, 2020, last year, I, I formed a nonprofit organization. So we are a 501c3 and uh, did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, so we can potentially be eligible for grants and then people can make tax deductible donations and you know, all that kind of stuff. And then- uh, I was gonna say, when, when you first um, decided, okay, this is what you're gonna do, beginning your research and design, did you find that sort of like the cosmos opened up and people showed up and you know, that serendipitous and that kind of stuff? There was, there was some of that. And I'll tell you that the biggest part of that was actually related to the sculptors. Uh, because some, I mean, before I opened up, some, some of the sculptures that are in the park are, in my opinion, pretty impressive pieces. And some of them took a big gamble on me. I mean, it's, you know, it's, yeah. but, but they really believed in, in what we were trying to accomplish and and I believe what we have accomplished I mean we've had thousands of people through and it's been getting incredible media exposure and just a lot of people are really loving it which is great but that was before we opened you know <laughs> and, and I, I'd say that was probably the biggest one I mean certainly other people you know the, the county loved it the chambers of commerce loved it you know I mean there was a lot of people who supported it but the sculptors were probably the biggest thing to to your question you know of yeah, this, you know, opening up and, and really helping out. That was probably the biggest part. Thanks. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, so uh, we opened in October of 2020. So uh, basically five months uh, we've been been open. And I originally was a little concerned because I said, oh man, we're opening during COVID. But as probably many of you know, a lot of people are looking for outdoor activities. And mm -hmm. uh, so it actually, I was initially reticent about it. I was even thinking of delaying the opening and I'm glad I didn't because quite the opposite. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's been a place that people can get outside and feel safe and not be in an enclosed spot. Perfect. Scott, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, this is Marty. Um, so you're obviously way too young to be thinking really seriously about this, but uh, those of us who are older and are starting to think about our, our wills mm -hmm. and our legacy, yep. um, is this in your will and do you have a plan for it to uh, keep on going in some way after your demise? Yeah, well, I've never been asked that question before, <laughs> That's, and it's a but it's a very uh, uh, insightful question. Or yes, uh, it's something that's very important to, to answer your question directly. Yes, I have a uh, what's called a living trust, and which is a, a variation on a will, and I specifically have set aside a, a significant amount of funds to help perpetuate it into the future. I my hope is that over time as we grow as a nonprofit, we'll be more eligible for, uh, for grants and things like that. Um, we do get donations from visitors. I, one of my guiding principles has been I wanted to make it free so independent of ability to pay, everybody could enjoy it. Uh, but nonetheless, there are two completely optional donation boxes at the entrance and you know we do get uh, donations and um, and sometimes people will mail in checks and stuff like that and that's something I'd like to grow over time so I'm hoping between the or my plan is between the the those two things um, you know to let it continue into the future I know for instance with uh, Big Rock Garden which is up in Bellingham uh, north of Seattle uh, I, this is not my plan but it was kind of interesting they had a private sculpture park George Drake who sadly died last year but he's kind of a local sculpture uh, uh, guru, or at least he was. And uh, he started that park with his family and actually the city of Bellingham actually purchased it and took it over uh, at, at uh, some point back in, not, not recently, not because of his death, but uh, you know, there are options like that as well. I wouldn't be surprised uh, given the reception that the park has had, I, I, the county uh, would likely would be you know willing to be you know given it or something like that I haven't even talked to him about it but I, I I would I would expect they probably would if that was needed in other words if my funds and donation funds couldn't keep it going as a nonprofit. well that's really nice thank you for that uh, Diana and my partner and I have been to Whidbey Island and we've spent considerable time there and I didn't know that this place was there so we didn't visit it when we were there but it's a magical place. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, the whole place, the whole thing, the, the villages that are there, the uh, people that live there, it's kind of like you go back a couple of centuries or maybe just a couple of decades, but it's a really precious place. And I'm just so delighted to have another thing that we can visit the next time we're up there. So thank you for doing this. Oh, uh, sure. it, it's a beautiful thing you've done. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for those kind comments. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's neat to be a part of the, the Whidbey experience now because people are actually coming from off island specifically to visit the sculpture forest. And then they're looking for other things to do, which of course, you know, people like the chambers of commerce and stuff like that. They love that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're all over that kind of stuff, but uh, it's kind of neat to be part of the, the Whidbey experience now. So um, just going to vision, I'll just uh, touch on this quickly, basically three main points of what, as far as my original goals for the, for the sculpture forest. One was to make it a combination of healthy, relaxing, informative, and especially fun. And the, a big part of that is to create enthusiasm among people for both art and nature. And that, that's been really an underlying principle throughout this entire thing. And you'll see that in some of our, some of my design principles and stuff like that, how, how the art enhances, enhances nature, nature enhances art as you experience the sculpture forest. 
And then uh, second uh, key vision point or goal is uh, to provide a great place for artists to, to, uh, to have a venue to display you know, their sculpture. And um, it's, it's been amazing seeing people who frequently would frankly probably never go to a gallery. Uh, they either don't relate to galleries. They don't think that, they, that they're a part of galleries. They, they're just a different part. They, there are so many people in the world who just, they just think that's just other people. And uh, as far as galleries, but they experience this and experience this with their families. And, uh, and I've personally seen people open up to the possibilities of art and sculpture that they weren't aware of. They weren't aware of what, what it's, of its possibility. Just this morning, as a matter of fact, as an example on Instagram, I saw a mother post a picture of her six-year-old daughter who was creating out of wood a sculpture. And she, it was because she was inspired by her visit to the sculpture forest you know, just this morning. Mm -hmm. And it's kind, of, it's kind of neat to see that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and then to our earlier discussion about uh, you know self-sustaining, uh, they, they, the goal is based on what I was just talking about uh, as far as funding and things like that, you know, to make it a self-sustaining and an integrated participant with the rest of the community. As far as uh, some of the public benefits we're going for, uh, preserving a fo the forest, uh, the forest itself is, uh, uh, there's, I'll go into that a little bit. It's a, it's a large forested viewscape. Uh, it's, a, it's on a bluff that overlooks uh, a, a large body of water there. And it's in a historical reserve called Evie's Landing National Historic Reserve. It's actually the only, only of its kind in the country. It's a National Park Service uh, area, 17,000 acres, that's mostly privately owned, but it has this overlay of, of history and nature on top of it. And I, I won't get into too much detail, but it's it, the Coopville area is in that reserve and this is in that reserve. Uh, encourage environmental education and uh, experiencing the environment. Providing accessible trails. We especially have one trail that is very level, very easy to walk on, and, and we eventually actually want to make it a hard surface to make it fully wheelchair accessible, even though actually people are already going into it with wheelchairs, uh, even though it's dirt right now. And uh, and then the other big thing is uh, providing a free outdoor art experience, uh, kind of to my earlier point of getting many people to experience art, uh, you know, not just uh, the tip more if you want to call it more typical art patrons, so to speak, but get you know many different types of people to experience art, uh, grow, support and grow the local arts community. And by local, um, certainly uh, including you, you know Pacific Northwest. And the nice thing is that uh, uh, we actually have folks that it's grown beyond that. We have people from um, from all over the country. And uh, actually, we've, in a couple in in a month, uh, we're going to have our first international sculptor. So <laughs> that'll be the very first one. So from Amsterdam. So. And then, uh, of course, increasing tourism uh, for Whidbey Island. Uh, the forest itself is uh, it's over 100 years old. Uh, it's a very diverse understory, uh, very healthy, uh, very uh, because it was professionally thinned over the years before I purchased it. So it's very, very healthy ecosystem. Uh, we've got a number of different certifications, and uh, and it's uh, it, it basically just kind of confirming <laughs> confirming that it's a, a very nice habitat. And then I already talked about the conservation easement. So uh, somebody, I, I, I can't see who's, uh, I can't see all the faces because of my view here, but whoever had asked me about the location. Uh, so Coopville, if, uh, actually, if I change my pointer here, there we go. Uh, so this is, this is the shores of Penn Cove here, and this is downtown Coopville. When, for those who have been there, downtown, of course, is you know, a relative turn. It's a very small rural town, but it's a very pretty town. Uh, and then this is, uh, this is a close up over here of the shape of the property. It's actually three parcels, but it's mostly this one larger parcel here. The, uh, this is just another view of it. This is a view from the water. So you can see this is what all would have been cleared. This, all these trees are on this property over here on the, on the right hand side. Uh, that's all cleared, you know, residences with great views and stuff. And, uh, but I've preserved all the trees so that, uh, you know, so that they, uh, they'll continue on. So now, uh, just hopping into a quick, a quick question, Scott. Yeah. Um, 
if you walk around the perimeter of that property, are we looking at an hour walk or an hour and a half? What is it? No, it's uh, well, it all depends upon what you do. It's a, it's a, it's only six tenths of a mile long. So uh, as far as the walk, so it's not even a mile. So it all depends upon how uh, how long you want to interact with the the sculpture, and uh, and I'll talk about the uh, there's a self guided tour that's available on uh, mobile phones, and so if you actually want to participate in that, it, it can it could easily take an hour and a half. Most people don't. Uh, my observation is most people are there usually about a half hour. You know, in other words, they they go, they kind of do the walk, enjoy it, and and, uh, and then they they might check a few of the self guided guided tour things, but not the whole thing. But. Thanks. Sure. So uh, what we have here, uh, to, uh, actually, uh, to your question about uh, oh. distance, there you go, uh, six tenths of a mile. Uh, I've set it up so that there are two loop trails. And the, 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 I'll go into the, these names, Nature Nurtured and Whimsy Way. Those are actually themes that I'll discuss here in a little bit. and. Uh, when I designed the trails, I designed literally every single foot of it. Every single foot, I put these little tape markers. I did hire a professional company that actually all they do is build trails. That's all they do. Uh, and I, I did that. But as far as the layout of it, I laid out every foot of it. And I, I, I located it to retain trees, but also to optimize sight lines so as you approach sculptures. And... I did a directional flow of the of the loops for two reasons. Number one, so that the sight lines could be optimized as you're approaching it. In other words, we know how you're going to approach the sculpture initially, so we can we can position a sculpture to have the best impact initially. Of course, we want to encourage people to walk around it and things like that, but uh, that way we, we know how most people are going to at least come upon it. And then the other thing is for privacy, uh, so that, you know, it, it, it when you have directional flow like that, then it, it, you don't tend to have people the other way, and, uh, and you get more privacy. The nice thing is, the nice thing is that uh, also in the time of COVID, of course, it also separates people out, which is good, but that's actually just a side benefit. That, uh, that wasn't even the original intention, uh, but you still get that same benefit. And uh, we also have uh, art education signage throughout. I'll talk about that in a little bit. That's uh, regarding our self-guided tour. Uh, and in general, just some general kind of, you know, the, the, the rules, uh, it's generally sunrise to sunset, uh, no dogs, bikes, horses, ATVs, and, it, and it's free, as I mentioned, for everyone to, to come. And here are some of the design principles. Um, so, one of the things is that the sculptures, I'm looking for sculptures that fit within our two themes, and I'll go into that here in a little bit, uh, as well as the immediate nat natural context of the, of the forest itself. Whenever I'm reviewing a sculpture that's been submitted, uh, it I, I first say, you know, does it fit with our two themes? And then does it fit within the forest? And then also I've got to consider how does it fit within the larger collection? Uh, in other words, sometimes I've, I've had to pass on some sculptures that are actually excellent sculptures, but it just didn't fit with one of those things. And, and by, by being consistent with that, I believe it's, it's even if I occasionally have had to pass on something that's really good, uh, by being consistent, I think it's kept the overall quality of the sculpture park uh, a little bit purer and, uh, and it, it's kind of kept the, the quality level up. And it's independent of the quality of a specific sculpture. It's you know, thinking of it as a, at a park level as opposed to at an individual sculpture level. Um, another big thing is every, every sculpture has its own space and focus. And what I mean by that is for the most part, as you go around the, the various trails, that, the, the two loop trails, every sculpture that, that you come upon, if you, look, if you look through the understory and the distance, you might be able to see something and that's okay. But for the most part, you, you never see another sculpture. Uh, completely different than the traditional sculpture park that's out on some, you know, looks like a golf course and, you know, with the grass and you, you know, you see 10 different sculptures from one spot and all that kind of stuff. Uh, completely different than that. Actually, I want to give every sculpture its own space and focus and, and, you're, and the observer, the visitor is not being distracted by the next one that's, you know, that's down the trail further. 
I also have oriented the trail to, to, uh, to actually go to different parts of the ecosystem. In other words, they, they, they actually show different parts of, or different environments, I would say, even though it's all contained within the same property, there are different plants and different, uh, different types of trees and openings and dense areas and things like that. And I actually deliberately, uh, made, deliberately oriented the trail so that you're touching on that. You get a lot of variety in a fairly small area uh, as far as the uh, the uh, habitat goes and uh, the, the other thing is I've really uh, really emphasized every sculpture kind of looks like it's supposed to be there and it's somewhat growing out of the ground almost and what I mean by that is uh, with, with one exception and that was because the sculptor requested that we actually see the the concrete footer. Um, with that one exception, every other one is actually sunk down with um, uh, with some, either some mulch or some kind of dirt over it so that you don't even see footers and things like that. You, you only see the sculpture and it's almost in all cases across the entire sculpture park. Uh, for instance, uh, wind shear, this, uh, this, this, uh, this large one here on the screen, um, it, that's about 14, 15 feet tall, something like that. Uh, it's got 2,400 pounds of concrete under it, but you can't tell. Uh, you, you, you come up and it looks like it's growing out of the ground. And, uh, and that's that kind of approach is very, very intentional. And another big thing that I think is one of the reasons that so many people enjoy visiting the park is I've, I've done it so that it has a sense of discovery. It's a nature park where people go to see the sculpture and they're interested and they want to know what's around the next bend. What, what, what's the next thing that they're going to see? What's the next sculpture they're going to see? And it's another reason to keep them separated, another reason to have turns and bends in, in, the, in the trail, and, uh, and it keeps people intrigued, you know. Uh, and it's been a big, big uh, hit, I guess you could say, or plus with uh, kids and families, uh, partly because of that, uh, which is part of the intention, you know, to, to get uh, people of all ages, including kids, excited about it. We have a, a small parking lot and uh, we're quickly finding that uh, it's, it, especially on nice weekends, it is, it is way overloaded. <laughs> so uh, we're, I'm going to be ex likely expanding that this year and it's still not going to be big enough. Um, but uh, fortunately we do have a side road and, uh, and they can, and, and, Frequently on nice weekend days, uh, parking lot will be full, and then the and then the, there'll be cars lined up and down both sides of the road, uh, uh, outside just as overflow, uh, which is you know again a nice problem to have. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, I, in the lower right there, that that's a uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Sculptors. Uh, um, uh, member that's Matt Babcock, and uh, he actually has two uh, two in the park, and that's Discobolus, and then he also has Standing Otter in the park as well. Uh, the one. So a couple of things. Oh, and actually, the, this just see this picture here. He's not a uh, not a, a member, but uh, he's at a Hood River, uh, McCray Wild. He's got a couple in the uh, park as, as well. So uh, if you're if you're ever interested to su uh, submit a sculpture uh, uh, idea, uh, there's a, on our site uh, you, you can find it if you just go to the menu uh, at the top of the of the site, or you can go directly to this link, sculptureforest.org/sculptures, and it has some information there that describes some of the stuff I'm describing to you here. And then uh, for artists, what Hi. we're oh yeah. Um, I, I just want to ask you about the sculpture in the picture um, on those concrete feet. Are they going to be covered with with dirt? Is that how you? They, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, because he's in the picture. That's as we were putting it in place. <laughs> so, yes, exactly uh, what yeah, yeah, yeah. In that case, uh, we, we always uh, actually uh, provide footers we, we, to whatever dimensions uh, the sculptor requests. Uh, in this case, uh, McCray is uh, he's a great guy. He's very um, uh, 
industrious, I guess you could say. And he actually came with his own. He pre, he pre made them. <laughs> and we, we brought them in on a on a, on hand trucks, which was wild. So we play, put them in place and then drilled into them, and you know it all worked. But uh, that's actually the only case where we've done that. We've in all other cases we've always uh, formed them. Uh, and some of the sculptures don't even need footers. So you know it, it all it's all dependent upon the individual sculpture. But yes, yeah, good good observation. Yeah, the, after this photo was taken, those were covered. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for artists, we're, we're always trying to encourage uh, the, the, the best sculptors and, the, and their best work. So uh, one of the things that we're, we offer for those that are for sale, we have some, some that are, uh, I'll go into that in a little bit, but we have uh, some that are for sale and some that are other, other uh, scenarios. And for those that are for sale, uh, we offer actually zero commission. Uh, so in other words, 100% to artists. And uh, I actually don't know of any other place that does that, and there might be, but I haven't heard of any. And uh, and that's just because you know we're we're not a gallery, we're not in the business of that, and uh, we want to support support the artists. So um, so anyhow, so that's one thing. We also have uh, we also have insurance, and unlike some other uh, some places that might just have liability insurance we actually have the full meal deal insurance in other words vandalism theft things like that so uh, we've got that across the entire collection uh, no entry fee uh, we we do uh, marketing of the sculptor and, and sculpture we create a web page for them we create a video for them um, and uh, and then like i mentioned earlier you know if the sculpture for sale we do whatever we can to help the sculptor uh, in other words things like you know we'll, we'll in advance uh, construct the footers and we'll assist with the installation and mounting and, and things like that. And uh, if the sculpture is donated or long term, and we actually have a number of those, uh, a number of people just really want to participate and, you know, they're not necessarily looking to sell their sculpture, but they'd love to be a part of it. And that's been great working with those sculptors as well. Um, then we take on even more of the logistics, you know, and others might include shipping or, or something like that. So. As far as logistics or considerations, uh, if you have you know, particular uh, sculptures that you might have in mind for something like this, for weight, uh, we've found that uh, generally speaking, and, and there are always exceptions, but as general guidelines, if it's something that is, is generally 1,100 pounds or less just because of the equipment we've used uh, to move on the small trails, that's usually good. Uh, we have sculptures that certainly weigh more than that, but they came in in sections. So, uh, you know, so in other words, the, you know, the individual pieces weighed less than 1,100 pounds each. And uh, generally, if one dimension of the sculpture can be less than five feet wide, uh, that's good just because of getting down the trails, you know. <laughs> so um, we have worked with wider and it's, it's all possible, but at the same time, that's generally a, a good, you know, a good general parameter. Height and length can be pretty open if, if it's less than five feet wide, but it's you know, 50 feet long, of course, that's kind of ridiculous, but you know, if it's 50 feet long, you know, we could, <laughs> we could put it on the trail and put the 50 feet in the direction of the trail and, and move it down the trail. So it's not as constrained in one dimension as it is in the other dimension. And then, uh, however, even if there is something that exceeds those general, you know, recommendations uh, around the main entrance parking area, it's essentially unlimited because you can get you know, trucks in there, you can get booms in there, uh, and and yeah, it, it's not it, so. There's not really any limitation on size or weight, and that this is especially, you know, some of this stuff especially comes up for larger stone sculptures or really big metal sculptures, stuff like that. So. I mentioned the themes and also if you remember there were those two trails that I talked those two loop trails. The first one is called Nature Nurtured and the second one is called Whimsy Way and our th we actually have themes so we're unlike the majority of sculpture parks out there which you know have a collection and they're high quality and all that but they don't generally don't tend to have themes unless it's with a, a short-term show. Uh, we actually have particular themes that we're looking for. And so Nature Nurtured essentially is our sculptures that represent the natural world in some way. They can either be inanimate elements such as star, moon, sun, mountains, earth, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, or it can be living creatures uh, of, the, of the natural world. And then Whimsy Way 
is oriented to fun. And I'll tell you, it's, it's been, I, I, the, the, the number of people who, again, enjoy art partly because of what we have in Whimsy Way, and it also allows them to experience the more, quote, serious uh, work of Nature Nurtured uh, is great. They, they, they complement each other. And Whimsy Way is, is fun. Uh, like this Tyrannosaurus Rex has almost become our ma mascot. Uh, and uh, a lot of people uh, come and they seek out, the, the find the T-Rex, <laughs> you know, and uh, they, that's all Whimsy Way. But uh, those are more oriented to fun, maybe a little bit humorous, uh, you know, or, or quirky in some way. And as far as the collection itself, uh, we currently have uh, 28 sculptures in the park and we're continuing to expand. I would expect, a lot of times people ask me, you know, how, how many sculptures do I look at would be the total number? And because of those design principles that I mentioned earlier, I there's no set number, but I would guess that the maximum would probably be about 40. I would just at a, at a guess in terms of available space and making sure that you generally are only looking at one sculpture at a time and you can't see other sculptures and everyone has its own space, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the idea is that over time we will rotate and uh, we'll rotate uh, sculptures in and out. We still have some really nice locations right now, uh, although we're, you know, not uh, like, you know, as you can see, there's 28 already. And I think 40 is probably the upper maximum that we would ever want there. So. And we already have uh, examples of four models in place uh, and it, it, we have them for sale. Uh, we have uh, some that have been uh, donated to the permanent collection. We have uh, some that are on long-term loan. And uh, we have one example of a donation by a patron that was actually in that video that you saw, the, 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 the neighbor who donated in the memory of his wife. And then uh, the longer term plan is actually to expand the permanent collection over time, including buying some of the ones that are on site as uh, that may be for sale if they haven't already been donated. And, um, and then also buy some just outside of the collection. Right now, since most of the funding is coming just from me, uh, I'm focused on infrastructure at the moment. So uh, in other words, I'm, I'm throwing money at things like parking lots and trails and, <laughs> and stuff like that. So, but as that stuff all settles, out then in the future we'll, we'll be focusing on expanding the permanent collection. Scott do you have any kinetic or set or acoustic sculptures? Not, um, not acoustic and uh, I, I love the idea of acoustic. I, I've seen some really interesting ones. Uh, we have uh, one really um, a really interesting kinetic sculpture by Jeff Kahn. He's, uh, he's uh, from Pennsylvania and that's wind shear, which is the one that I, I had mentioned earlier that it was about 15 <laughs> feet tall. Uh, that the, the three <laughs> elements at the top actually move. And even though it's such a large sculpture, it's designed to move in less than two mile per hour breezes. And it does, it's pretty amazing <laughs> that it's got a lot of mass to it and it just elegantly moves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, that's the only um, the only full kinetic sculpture uh, that we have right now. But uh, we do have that one in. I gotta see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff's great. He's he's uh, he's been doing kinetic sculpture for year, years. Uh, he actually has international commissions, and he has commissions all around the country. He's. Uh, he, I, he, when I, when I got him to participate, I, I did a happy dance. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he had no idea who I was, but I definitely knew who he was in his work. And I reached, I reached out to him and, uh, yeah. and he, he was just really supportive of what we're doing. And, uh, he actually, it, he, there are two, there are two sculptors who have not been to the park yet. And uh, he's one of them. Uh, so, uh, so he actually is, he really wants to come out and, uh, but he actually, he actually shipped it. And uh, the other one is from New York city. Cool. Yeah. So 
we have a uh, we also have an interactive mobile phone tour, and it's very sculptor centric uh, in terms of the way everything is pr uh, presented. Uh, there's brief instructions and a launch page at the at the entry kiosk as you come into the park. Uh, no app is needed, which uh, some other places who actually have tours a lot of times you have to download an app onto your phone. Uh, in this case, it's all web based, so all you need is a phone with a data connection, and you know pretty much every smartphone out there has a web browser or just get to the web. So it makes it a lot easier for people to use. Also gives us a lot more freedom in how we can have content on the pages. This in, in the, well, yeah, on, on the page, uh, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, distract myself here. <laughs> I'll stop that sentence. Um, so uh, as far as um, along the way, you can jump into the tour at any sculpture plaque along the way. So even if you don't start the tour at the beginning, every sculpture along the way has a sculpture plaque and has two things. There's a QR code and it also has a, um, actually, uh, and it also has a very short URL. So if somebody doesn't know how to use a QR code, uh, they then they can type in the, the URL directly if, if that's easier for them as two different ways to get to it. And um, yeah, one, actually while I'm thinking of it, I will diverge a little bit here. Uh, one thing that I've uh, implemented on uh, about the plaques is, uh, look, I'll, I'll just tell you about this now. I was going to tell you later, but I, I have every plaque on the opposite side of the trail, opposite side of the trail from the sculpture. And I don't know any other place that does that, but I, it's very intentional. Two, two things. Again, it's the idea of having the best impression and interaction with the sculpture. When somebody does a sculpture, they generally are not also thinking of this thing on a post with a, a you know a sign on the front you know and so it gives it its space its visual space and then the second advantage is that when visitors are trying to take a picture of a sculpture they can truly get a good angle and they're not trying to get this darn plaque out of the way you know visually out of, out of their photo so anyway a little bit of a a little bit of diversion there but. <laughs> So every sculptor has a custom web page produced for them. Uh, we interview the sculpture on site. So it's as if you're walking around and every day, uh, every day, every sculptor is literally standing right by this sculpture. Every sculptor is standing right by this sculpture in the park. And that's where the video is recorded. And they're literally, so it's as if you, the viewer, have this sculptor standing there in front of the sculpture talking to them. And it's a three to five minute video. Uh, shorter is actually better in terms of keeping people's attention nowadays, but you know, it's usually a three to five minute video. And uh, it, it's uh, basically two main topics, the sculptor telling a little bit about their background and how they, why they got into sculpture, and then uh, explaining about the sculpture itself, uh, which may uh, get into its underlying meaning and how it was constructed, things like that. And uh, then for those who don't want to watch the video, there is also photos, text, and uh, or just direct contact info. So, uh, you know, their website or whatever they want to share, website, phone number, email, whatever they want to share is, is on there, whatever the sculptor wants to share. And then any for sale info, if it's applicable. As far as the future, you know, where are we going? Uh, you know, so we've already got quite a bit and actually, you know, most people would say it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a complete, certainly sculpture park at the moment. Uh, I do have plans for the future. Uh, one of them is, like I mentioned, I want to make an ADA accessible trail. Uh, there are already people with wheelchairs going through the one loop uh, that's flat and I'd like to make that surface even better for that. Uh, I'd like to add some electrical hookups further into the forest trails. A couple reasons there, uh, so I can extend Wi-Fi. So for people who don't have good, I actually already offer Wi-Fi, but uh, at, but it's only around the parking lot where the electrical, where the security cameras are right now. And um, I actually like to extend it into the forest. And then also that that opens up some opportunities. You know, some people have have, have contacted me. They have light sculpture. Yeah, in other words, you know, sculpture that. In, incorporates light, lighting into it, you know, things like that. So it, it, it would open up some opportunities. So I'd like to do that. Uh, maintenance shed, uh, adding like a meditation space or a small gazebo. 
Uh, we're in, in talks with one uh, local uh, owner to potentially buy a little bit more land. And uh, if we do that, we might use it partly for more parking, frankly, uh, but uh, also a couple other things. And, uh, and then also the big long range, the biggest next project, but that's TBD on when it'll happen, is to uh, actually build a building that is specific to be a, an indoor gallery. And then that'll open up the opportunity for indoor sculpture. Is somebody trying to say something? Oh, okay, I thought I heard something. Um, so, uh, so the idea on on this, and this is kind of again our longer longer term plan: indoor sculptures and have some wall mounted art. Uh, potentially, some uh, artists who could come to actually do some working demonstrations. Uh, the nice thing is it'll actually provide a, a way for the artists to, to uh, especially if they're local, uh, to provide a visitor interaction if uh, uh, for those who. Um, you know, for those who can be there. Uh, also provide an official restroom. Right now we just have a portable, you know, basically a porta potty uh, out by the uh, parking lot, uh, which people appreciate just having that, but at the same time, this would be more of an official restroom. There's some administrative space. Um, the ga it would be the very similar gallery space is, you know, still not for profit. So uh, anything that came from it, either donations or small commissions uh, would go to help maintain the park. And we're, one thing that I've been really um, thinking about, haven't really approached anybody about this, but is the idea of potentially partnering with an, either an arts organization or a gallery, maybe even like a co-op gallery or something for an on-site presence. In other words, they would get the benefit of a beautiful building and a beautiful setting and, and public traffic and all that kind of stuff. And then the park would get the benefit of having, you know, full-time people there and, uh, you know, get the, the activity that uh, either a gallery or an arts organization would create. So it'd be a kind of mutually beneficial situation, so. And then uh, another thing that we're doing, is, or I'm doing, I should say, is uh, creating a, uh, working with others and uh, creating a team of volunteers. And they've been really, really uh, critical to uh, to everything that we've been doing. Uh, that that's for sure. The volunteers have been been great, and it's a gradually growing uh, group of people, and uh, it involves things like trail upkeep and landscaping, and 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 actually. Uh, uh, cleaning the sculptures, all that kind of stuff. And eventually where I'd like it to go is um, some of the stuff that basically only I do now, which is things like social media, tour guides, uh, on-site docents, things like that. So that's where I'd like it to head in the future. The feedback from the community and from tourists has been great. I've, I've heard of so much stuff from people in person and direct emails and, and seeing so much on social media and it's in increasing. And at the end, I have a thing at the end of the trail, uh, there's an exit kiosk and I have something called a participation book. And what that is, is it's most people would call it a guest book, but I actually have a sign above it and I encourage people to draw or write poetry or something like that. And the, uh, the goal is for people to kind of get a sense of participation. And also I say on there, there's something particularly good shows up. I'll actually put it on our website and <laughs> social media, share it with others you know, and uh, get, get some pretty entertaining things in that book that's for sure uh, so the the overall uh, the overall feedback has just been uh, been very gratifying and really really positive so it's been nice to see that we've also been getting uh, quite a bit of, of media coverage and it's been uh, ex expanding uh, and just lots of print online, you know, we met that one TV show that you already saw, you know, things like that. So it's been great to get that uh, kind of uh, recognition. And one thing I wanted to uh, offer everybody uh, is uh, if you, if any of you ever wanted to get a group together and uh, come up and uh, get a personal tour, I would love to give it to you. So, uh, you know, provide a personal tour and just to go around and explore. So uh, I'll just, I'll just leave that open invitation. And uh, if you're ever interested to have a personal tour, uh, just reach out to me anytime and, and we can arrange something. And uh, that's my contact info. And that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions or comments.
Yeah, I saw you, you were talking about you've got volunteers for maintenance and then as you grow your permanent uh, collection, you know, are you, conservation is always a challenge on some of those. You've got that kind of in your forethought of where you're going to go with trying to take care of these pieces? I think it's... Yeah, it all, de well, it all depends upon what it is. Uh, for instance, I there are two wooden sculptures that the sculptors just know from the beginning. It's organic material. They're actually interested to see how it will degrade and decompose. <laughs> you know? So, you know, so there's that, there's that, there's that end of the spectrum. And um, then in terms of others, for instance, uh, some of the metal sculptures we, we clean, uh, we do have one that is uh, the, the finish on it uh, is, is starting, we're starting to get a little bit of surface rust. So we, you know, we talked to the sculptor about what, uh, what they would recommend. Others oh, are clear cut. It, it's so situation dependent, you know, um, nothing, nothing lasts forever. And everybody, everybody understands that, you know, uh, if, if a particular sculpture is, if, if, you know, especially if it's part of the collection, uh, then, you know, if it needs some kind of periodic maintenance of some kind, then that would be part of our plan. And uh, we would just, you know, whatever, if it needs to be repainted or, you know, refinished in some way. Well, we really appreciate the invite. I think I, I know from PNWS's point of view, like I'd love to try to create a, uh, after we can interact and get out those groups, look at down the points and maybe create a one hosted by us and have a, as many as possible make the road trip up and, and come visit and make an event out of it. I think it'd be a really great event. Yeah, it'd be so fun. You could, uh, especially, well, what was that, Dave? Yeah, and combine it maybe with some other sculpture groups that are around there so we could maybe have it as a place to connect and yeah absolutely yeah there are uh, several other uh, smaller sculpture parks gardens on uh, on Whidbey and you know in addition of course others that you could find on the way and uh, I'm sure they they would I'm sure if we got something organized they'd be happy to participate and uh, depending upon where we and the world is on COVID things and all that I'd be uh, happy to have you all over our, my house for, you know, shindig and food and all that kind of stuff. So that, that would be fun. <laughs> uh, Scott, in the uh, beginning of your presentation, you mentioned you'd been to several other sculpture parks that really impressed you and kind of helped you get this thing going. And you mentioned there were three in particular that, that uh, you liked. Do you remember off the top of your head which ones they were? And I'd like to write them down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there's the uh, San Juan Island Sculpture Park, which is, of course, on San Juan Island. Uh, that's in Roach Harbor, and that's an outdoor uh, sculpture park. Uh, it's been in, it's been around for about 20 years, something like that. It's one of the longer ones in the in the area. The uh, second one is a Big Rock Garden, which is the one I mentioned that had been owned by George Drake's family and is now run by the city of Bellingham. That's a, a much smaller park. It's a two and a half acre park, though uh, very well done. And they've, it's pretty amazing what they've been able to fit within two and a half acres. And they've done a really good job of preserving the forest on that two and a half acres. It's actually kind of unusual because it's two and a half acres in the middle of a just a, a cookie cutter subdivision on all sides. It's like this little oasis. So that's the second one. And the third one is called Webster's Woods, which is in Port Angeles, which is on the north side of the Olympic Peninsula. And, uh, and that one is a five acre uh, park, uh, has a, a trail and uh, it's, that one is, is fun. I, I, that, that, was, that one's a, a fun one to see. So those were the three that were the, yeah, like I said, I've been to others, but those are, are in m the, my general neck of the woods, so to speak. And uh, I really enjoy all three of those. Thank you. I would, I, excuse, go ahead. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. I just want to really appreciate your conservation angle on this because um I'm so happy that you're not cutting trees or as minimal as possible and keeping the mycelium healthy and the network between all of the, you know, the species there. It just makes me so happy. <laughs> I can't wait to come see the mix of sculpture and natural 
beautifully preserved trees. Thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. Thanks for, yeah, that, that's, that's really fundamental to the whole concept. And it's, it, so that entire six tenths of a mile double loop trail, uh, I, I positioned the trail so that we only removed two trees that were four inches in diameter. And that's it. Oh. Yeah, the entire the entire entire length. Yeah. Well, that's a great thing. It's you know they in in this context, I, I I truly believe what I said earlier, where the 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 natural habitat provides a terrific backdrop for the the sculptures. I mean, it's just it's 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 such a neat experience for experiencing the sculpture, and then vice versa. Uh, you know, I I've seen a lot of people go through forest trails and they seem to be looking at their boots you know they're just kind of walking mm -hmm. through and they're you know they're just kind of making a mile they're getting exercise you know whatever and uh when they are sculpture in the midst of that natural habitat people are paying attention and they're 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 looking forward to what's around the corner and they're looking up i mean they're looking up for the next sculpture they're also looking at the the, the bushes and the trees and maybe a barred owl or a pileated woodpecker or an eagle you know all of which are on our property and you know and things like that so have you been to the Kroller Mueller sculpture park in Am or near Amsterdam? I have not. No, I've heard it of it. It kind yeah. of reminds me a little bit of, although it wasn't as as well naturally planned as yours probably, but it, it reminds yours reminds me of it a little bit because it has those isolated natural areas for each piece. I mean, some of them are 40 feet tall, but you know, not very many, but um, you know, there's just, it's, it's magical. I think you'd really enjoy that one too. Hmm. Sounds like I, I need to make a trip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the attention to detail, how you have like all, all of the interconnected thoughts. I mean, it's just mindfulness. You know, it's as if everything, the, the, the sight line and, and even getting people to be standing back from it. Just, I, I can't believe it. It's just I mean, incredible. It's just, yeah. It, yeah. I well, really can, I can't wait to visit. Great, thank you. One of the things I enjoy most about this group is that it is such an, an eclectic mix of people. And um, this is, this is, Scott is, Scott represents like a completely different facet of the sculpture world for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate your time and sharing mm -hmm. um, all this wonderful information about your vision, and I'm I'm certain we're all anxious to get there. So weekday weekend, what what's the what's the ideal time to come? Yeah, travel wise well, and, day, and crowd I mean, Yeah, definitely weekday if possible. But weekends are nice too. Uh, well, and the only reason I say that is just because it tends to be more busy on the weekends. So you know, but. Uh, actually, the it's harder to plan around, but uh, I always tell people if they can plan around the weather, come on a nice weather day. <laughs> so that's kind of the that's kind of the most important thing. It's an outdoor you know outdoor experience, but can't always plan around that part. But um, yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, more you you can you'll have less people to you know contend with a lot less on the weekdays than the weekends. What what a great uh, confirmation that your original vision came. Uh, to, to be when the, the uh, young persons uh, said, I, I went home and started building a sculpture for an outdoor setting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Truly transformed I, the, uh, the, the land into something that uh, it's, it's, it, it's timeless. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. And, and actually another, uh, another similar thing that I've heard many times is uh, from specifically from kids because that was a good kid example uh, i've seen kids who or well, the family will go through the park and normally you know the kids going to drag in their feet and all this kind of stuff they'll come back to the beginning and they want to go through again they want to go <laughs> experience it again and uh and uh, that's probably one of the you know the, be the better things that a kid can do is say they want to they want to do it again right now you know? <laughs> very cool all right, Scott, thanks again. Thank everybody else for participating tonight. Uh, reminders again, if you're interested in the opportunity in Hood River, get in touch with me. If you are interested in being interviewed uh, in collaboration with International Sculpture Day, please get in touch with Andy or me. Um, if you're an active member, 
please update your page on the new website so that we can look a little more a little more together and um, finally take a look at the isc website the sculpture.org website and if you see anything that you think would be good to put into our partnership agreement with them as a member benefit for us um, let uh, either dave or i know so thanks again, everybody. Um, I can leave this meeting open if anybody wants to just hang out and chat. Otherwise, um, I think we're done. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Chaz. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Thank great. you, Scott and Chaz. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And Dave. Totally inspired.